Thank you. Um, you. You can stay exactly where you are. If you'd like to move in closer, please feel free. Um, this is the main attraction over here. So those of you are sitting far away, if you can see, that's fine. If you want to be closer, by all means, come closer. Um, I don't know if any new students have shown up since I made the announcement that all students, we ask to please sign in on the piece of paper in the back with your name and your email address. And um, we would really greatly appreciate that. Okay, so, you all see Pam's phone? Oh, Pam's phone? You call me, I hear it. Thank you. Pam needs her phone, because if I know Pam, she's going to be taking pictures yes. and video. Okay. All right. So, first off, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to all of you for coming here tonight. You're in for a treat. Yes. This is an amazing group of women that we have here today. Um, I'd like to start off by offering thanks to the sponsors of this event. Um, I, my name is Sandra Joy. I'm a professor here. I know most, many of you, not all of you, but I know many of you here. I'm a sociology professor here at Rowan. I've been here about 20 years, and I have brought lots of folks here before who are powerful, inspirational speakers, and this panel proves to be no less than what we've had in the past. It's gonna be as wonderful as any of the others, if not more, that we've had in the past. Uh, but uh, I want to, um, I want to thank the Sociology and Anthropology Department as one of the sponsors my department, also the Social Justice, Inclusion, and Conflict Resolution <coughs> Center. That's a mouthful, S-J-I-C-R, we've learned to call it quickly, um, is another sponsor of this event. From the Social Justice, Inclusion, Conflict Resolution Center, my colleague who recently left to go to another physician named Joanna Murphy was very instrumental in kicking off this event. We got together at the end of last semester and said, you know what, for Women's History Month, let's bring a dyna dynamic group of women to campus to inspire all of us. And so I'm in deeply, deep gratitude to Joanna for helping me, even though she is not here at Rowan any longer. She texted me her um, best wishes and good luck, and she's with us in spirit today. She would most certainly be here if she could. Um, in addition, I want to thank PRISM. PRISM is a student organization that um, advocates for the LGBTQ community, and they also um, helped financially sponsor this event. And so those three entities, the Social <coughs> Justice Center, Sociology and Anthropology Department, and PRISM gave the financial backing for this event to uh, occur. So we want to thank all, of, all three of those sponsors. In addition, I know she's not here, but I really hope she's going to see the recording of this um, the secretary of SJICR, Tara Ferrucci, who all of our speakers have come to know quite intimately um, over the last couple of months, has walked them through the inordinate amount of paperwork they've acquired in order to get speakers to come to campus. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> but um, they maintained their patience, as I knew they would, and so did Tara. And Tara, if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be here today, because she helped make this happen. In addition to Tara, I would love to thank um, Mary Beth Bates. And Mary Beth, stand up. Let's give you a hand. We can on behalf of that. Mary Beth is my student who also has been interning under Tara and formerly Joanna um, at the Social Justice Center. And Mary Beth was very instrumental in helping us with many, many tasks required to put this evening together. So I'm very grateful to you, Mary Beth. Um, I have to note you. Um, Sunny Singh is in the back. Okay. Give him a hand. Hey, Sunny. Sunny comes through, and I have to tell you, in my crazy, busy life that I've been having lately, I remembered to call Sunny last night. And look, at, he's here wow. with wow. one night's notice. Um, wow. So I'm gratitude for Sunny. Sunny plans to put this on YouTube, and we'll make sure everybody gets a link afterwards and please help to spread it because that's why we're not that upset that this room isn't full because we know that we'll be able to by all means come on in um we're able to share the link um to people for years to come all right so thank you sunny for being so gracious and coming in such short notice yes come on in. Yeah. so all all you missed so far gail and others is my 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a missile. There's some dynamic women coming in right now. So thank you for coming. She's not here, but I hope she sees the uh, YouTube uh, program enough to know that we're appreciate, appreciative of Etta, et cetera, who also was very instrumental in helping particularly Paulette with the paperwork that I mentioned before. It's really kind of crazy. So if Etta could be here, she's in Pittsburgh, she would. But she's with us in spirit, and Etta, thank you very much for your help. Um, finally, I'd like to thank my partner, Russ Pierce, for my, so the support that he's offered me throughout the last, I don't know how many weeks since I've been trying to put this together, so I appreciate the love and support that you offer me, so thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, here's how the program is going to unfold. We have four amazing stories that could fill easily hours, each one of them. So, but we're going to have to, in the interest of brevity, keep them each to 20 minutes. Mary Beth's going to help us with that. <laughs> um, so we're, they're each going to take 20 minutes to share their story. But before I do that, I just want to do one quick thing. I just would like to, in an introduction to this, um, this, and then I'm going to introduce each of them, this program and this panel, we, uh, again, we wanted to do this event in honor of Women's History Month. We all know, women and men sitting in this room, that women have been neglected for the role that they have played in sparking change in the spirit of resistance and freedom fighters, yes. et cetera, et cetera, throughout history. Yes. Right. Yes. So I'd like to have you join me in calling out some of those names and I'll get us started. Okay. Ida B. Wells is my girl. Okay. I love some Ida B. Wells. Mm -hmm. Fanny Lou Hamer. Anybody Lou. else? Marilyn Buck. Marilyn Buck. Alfred right. Duval. Uh, thank you very much. Anybody <laughs> else? Angela Davis. Angela Davis. Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman. We were just at Angela the um, statue last night. My Angela. Yeah. Yep. Ella Baker. Ella Baker. Asana Shakur. Asana Shakur. Jen Finch. Jen Finch. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. Rosa Parks. Yes. Yes. There's yeah. many. We could go on and on, but in the interest of time, I want to tell you all. But these names that we're throwing out throughout our history, um, and still some of them are with us, like Angela Davis, have um, made great change in creating social justice for everyone. And they did not get their due. They were often in the shadows. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer just uh, had an amazing speech here in New Jersey um, years ago and did not get her attention. Um, Ida B. Wells ran out of Memphis. You know the stories. Yeah. I want to, I submit, those, these are my sheroes, so thank you for helping me identify the sheroes that we could go on and on. These four women are also my sheroes. And I don't know if I can even introduce them without crying. I'm so moved by their stories. They were gracious enough to speak in my class that we just held this afternoon in the um, sociology department <coughs> called Children and Families of the Incarcerated. So they spoke to my students about the impact of their incarceration on their families and their children very moving. You're in for such a treat to hear their stories. I want to tell you that we have, I'm happy that we have with us Paula Harrington. Paula. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Alvarez. Debbie, Debbie, who you may have seen here at Paula before. She came out Paula. Gladys, Scott. coming out of this one. That's because she came up here all the way from Florida, but she's really, well, Chicago originally. And Mississippi. Well, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's not your ear. She's got a little bit of a twang going on. So, I'm honored to call you all my sheroes, my dear friends, and I'm very moved and particularly grateful to each of you for sacrificing your time and your love and your heart, your stories have inspired me from the time I've met each of you. And it's been a long time uh, in the making uh, for Gladys coming home and for Debbie coming home and I'm more recently meeting the other two amazing women. And I'm just so grateful you're in my life. I wanna thank you. We're gonna, without further ado, I need to shut up and sit down. So you can hear these amazing women. Then after they each have their 20 minutes, I have a little something I wanna share with you and we'll open up the Q&A. All right, so let's all welcome them. We're going to start with Cynthia Alvarado. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Cynthia Alvarado, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for everyone coming out. First, I want to say that I was born and raised in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia. My parents were immigrants, uh, Puerto Rican, a low socioeconomic class. Um, I was uh, intellectually inclined when I was young. However, because my parents were immigrants, um, we had a lot of lack of resources. There was a lot of domestic violence in my home and a lot of childhood traumas that went unaddressed. I went on to live my life as an adolescent and um, I started to realize that all of those traumas that were unaddressed kept resurfacing as I you know, grew older. In my decision making, you know, picking boyfriends and, and hanging out with people that were you know, a little, little questionable, I realized that something was wrong, right? I tried to use material things to cover up those pains, relationships, and nothing worked, right? So um, in 2006, I was in a fatal car accident and my uncle lost his life. I survived, yes. Sorry. I started to self-medicate after the accident. And where a lot of people didn't understand me, they were judgmental of me. I was hurting inside. And this went on for about you know a year. Not only was my uncle gone, I had injuries that I sustained to my pelvis. I had to learn how to walk again. On top of just going on and on, trying to go on with my life with these childhood traumas, you know, resurfacing again, I had this new accident and the loss of my uncle. About a year later, I went to rehab to try to, you know, kick this opioid addiction that the doctors prescribed to me. Um, and I wasn't able to do that. I, the first day that I was released from rehab, I started to self-medicate with Xanax, right? I substituted one pill for another. On the day that, uh, that the incident happened with the crime, I went to a park in North Philadelphia with my cousin. Um, there solely to just self-medicate. Something happened, my cousin killed someone. I never went that day to hurt anybody. Solely, I was just a little girl trying to you know, live my life with a lot of pain. Later on that night, I was arrested for murder, uh, robbery, homicide. Um, I thought it was a game, I thought it was a joke because I didn't kill anybody. I never left my car, I never even knew that a crime had been committed. However, you know, I was arrested, I went to the county jail. At this time, I didn't realize that the Constitution that as a little girl I loved so much, it didn't apply to me. I realized that um, everything that I, you know, as a little girl I pledged a flag every morning and I was so proud to be a first generation American. When I finally decided that I would go to trial and fight my case because I didn't commit the crime is when I realized that, you know, the Constitution not only did not apply to me, but I was being charged for a crime that was committed by a male. Somebody else committed this crime, so my constitutional rights were violated, my due process, you know, um, my individual culpability of not even leaving the car was never taken into consideration. I went on to trial to fight for my life. I was sentenced, um, I went to trial, I lost, I was um, sentenced to life without parole, and in Pennsylvania, everybody knows that there's no parole eligibility. I went to prison, I lost everything. I lost my finances, my children, my life was upside down. But I kept telling myself, sin, you gotta fight. You gotta fight sin and you don't give up. And you know, being in prison, everybody knows here that it is designed to break you down. It is designed to destroy you and to rip families apart. So I decided to educate myself while I was in there, not by the prison, but myself. I became a jailhouse lawyer. I fought my case so hard. And after the 11th year, I won my federal habeas petition. Less than 1% of the worldly population wins that appeal. I worked so hard for my freedom. I exhausted all of my resources. My family was poor. You know, my visits started to get less and less. There was periods and times where I didn't see my children for years. You know, it was either my, my children get sneakers or I get a visit. And anybody knows as a black and brown person, you know, in Philadelphia, you know, we're struggling. With, with that being said, I never gave up and I kept on fighting. And when I was inside, I met some extraordinary women. Paulette is one of my good friends, I love you. 
But I met a lot of women that are deserving to come home. Women that have been in there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. These women mentored me, taught me to stay strong on days when I couldn't even get past a week. A week. Well, when I was in the county jail before I went to trial, I was sexually assaulted by a guard. My little cousin escaped CFCF and it was all over the news. Um, you know, he escaped, so they put me in the hole while he was gone for 50 days. I became a subject for the guards. I was physically beat by them, and I was sexually assaulted. And anybody that knows in Philadelphia, there's a lot of corruption, right? I kept this to myself, and I lived with a secret for so long. Not only was I fighting for my life of state, this induced my mental health. I started to have a lot of suicidal thoughts, and uh, a lot of days, I feel like I didn't want to live. But I made a promise to my daughters that I would never give up and that I would keep trying until the day that I died. I came home, and it was like a dream come true because they told me, you're never getting out. You're a bad mother. You're a bad person. But I told them, no. I had to tell myself every day, you're worth it. You're strong and you're beautiful, sin. It doesn't matter what society said about me. It didn't matter that they labeled me a killer. I knew that I was never those things. I've been home now for almost two years. I'm a, a political activist. I am a public speaker. But more importantly, I have a lot of comrades that I left behind the wall, and I am a voice for them. I managed to gain some traction on social media, and the government got pissed and hacked my page. But they will not stop me. I will continue to spread truth and knowledge until my comrades are home. I can tell you that because of my gender, I was oppressed. I went to trial, first of all, for a crime that was committed by someone else. My constitutional rights didn't even matter. I was oppressed for being a woman, for a woman, being a woman, for having physical attributes, for being a poor Latina from North Philadelphia, being on a drug corner. But I was raised on a drug corner. For society to expect anything different from me was irrational. However, we already know that the system doesn't play fair. Today, um, I am a positive person in my community. My incarceration didn't help me. If anything, it tried to destroy me. But I'm here today to say that, you know, we are not our worst day. We are not what society says we are. And even though we come from these neighborhoods that are disenfranchised with the lack of resources, we always can make a change to prove people wrong. Um, I just want to thank all of the women here today. I love you girls. I have learned so much from every one of you. Um, I say that, you know, forgiveness and compassion is the key to living a healthy life, right? And to not being like the people that have oppressed us for so many years. I don't want to be like those people. You know, that's why I choose the path of love, the path of being compassionate. And more importantly, every day I get up and I fight, just like I did in prison. And I'm going to continue to do that until we spread this message that mass incarceration is a big lie. That prison doesn't help you, but they're hijacking our communities and trying to destroy us. And we need to unite. And um, I thank you, Sandra um, Joy, for, for having us today and everyone for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Paula Carrington, and I'm one of the juvenile lifers that was released in 2017, April Fool's Day. Ha <laughs> ha. So uh, I just wanted to say that um, I went to jail when I was 16, but I went to Muncie when I was 17. But uh, uh, before I went, uh, I mean, I, I lived in a home with my parents, my siblings. We had a really, really good upbringing, so to speak. Uh, of course, I made a bad decision after my mother died when I was 14 years old. And that just blew my mind. I mean, my, my dad was everything, but my mom was my every everything. So when my mother died, I went from, you know, I, tables changed. It, it, you know, it, it turned for me. Uh, a year later, my dad met this woman, and she had mental health issues. But and I know my dad loved us. I do know that. 
but he was too busy worrying about his relationship and he wasn't looking at the welfare of his kids. And the lady became very abusive. First she became verbally abusive, mentally abusive, then she, then she became physically abusive. Uh, we got in a fight, she cut me on the face, she was trying to cut my throat, but she didn't. Of course I whooped her ass. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, excuse my French, but uh, I'm keeping it 100. Uh, uh, let's see, my dad was like, he was still like in, a, a, in I don't know, in the days somewhere. I don't know what was going on with my dad, but I know he, lost, he was still, he was uh, uh, missing his wife that he was with for over 33 years. You know what I mean? So he, he went to whatever he thought could help him get through that pain. You know, my dad wasn't a bad dad. He just wasn't right at that time for me and the rest of us. So anyway, uh, I wanted to get out that situation. I had met this older guy when I was 15. Uh, he was 30. Uh, he knew my family. He hung out with my brothers. They played basketball and all that. And me being vulnerable at the state I was in and just going through a whole lot, I was just messed up. The rest of my family, uh, they, they were there, but my father didn't want us, want, want us to say what was going on. Because he kept saying, I'll take care of the situation. I'll handle this. So loving our father like we did, we trust that that was going to happen, but it didn't happen. So anyway, uh, I met this guy and... You know, we got together. <laughs> uh, I got pregnant, and uh, I refused an abortion. I was not going to do that. So uh, I had my son. Um, after my son was born, maybe uh, I, he was, we were very close. Uh, I say when he was like 10 years old, his dad was trying to take him away from me. So... My family was not having, they said technically, she was 15 years old and you were 30. That was statutory rape. So I told my family, no, we're not going to say that. We're not going to do that. You can't take from the willing. And at the time I was going through so much, I thought he was my knight in shining armor, but he wasn't. And <laughs> I'm keep, you know, and you know, it's just, just things that you learn as you go along in life. So, uh, anyway, I get in trouble, uh, I fight the lady back, I grab a knife, I stab her son, he dies, and uh, I go to jail, they give me life with no possibility of, of, of uh, parole. Now my life is shattered already, so you can imagine what I was going through at that age, I had to be around people I didn't even know. I had to adjust to a new environment that people I didn't know, things I didn't, wasn't familiar with. It just was so hard on me. And yeah, I was bitter because I felt like I should have got, I had to get something for what I'd done, but I didn't think I should have gotten a life sentence. So anyway, uh, my son got shot and killed in New York. He had just turned 18. And uh, that was in 1996. And uh, they tried to blame it on a drive-by shooting, but we knew that it was the officers that killed my son. He was with two other guys. They got to running, and uh, the cops got to shooting. He got, and they shot him in the back of his head. So, I mean, my family had the task force. They, they, they did everything they could to try to bring them to justice, but black families don't have no money, don't have no resources, and we couldn't do anything like we wanted to do. So they kind of swept it under the rug. Uh, so, you know, I, you know I, my, high, my, my main thing is God got me through. There's no one else in this world could have got me through what I got through with my higher power. And every day, I thank him because there's no way I would have made it without my God. 
And I don't know what anybody else's belief is, but I know for a fact there's no one like that man up above. So I get home and I do speaking engagements. I'm with my family. That was okay for a while, but they, they, I was away from so, for so long. It's like, I'm not that kid that left. You know, I'm an old ass woman now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they all old. And you know, they sat in their ways. And so I went through it with my sister for a while. You know, I, I love my family dearly, don't get me wrong, and I know they love me. And so one day I went through it so bad, I called Dana, and I told her what was going on. I said, Dana, I got to get out of here. Like, I'm going through it with my sister and my niece. I don't understand it. So I called uh, Doc Collins and Pastor Collins. They were there for me. So I called her today. I talked to her. I said, Look, Pastor Collins, I got, I got to get out of here. I knew she had transitional living, and Dana had all explained that to me. And Pastor Keith, and she said, pack your stuff. I'm coming to get you today. I said, oh, I can't go today. I got to get with my PO. Let me not move. She said, well, soon as you get packed, we'll be there to get you. So, you know, they, they were a blessing in the sky. They're still a blessing. They was at my hearing and everything, and I love them dearly. So I lived out there for a few months. I moved around a couple of times. And my oldest brother, that's my hero, and he lives in Georgia. And he, he said, get yourself a place. So I got my own place. Uh, I did the uh, speaking engagement. Just bear with me. And uh, the uh, president of community college was there. And he heard my story. And I'm working at community college. Girl, don't play with me. Won't he do it? All right now. So, you know, I just want to say, and I, I fight for the people that I left behind. I love them dearly. I go see them when I can. I write them. I don't do a lot of writing. That's in cards. You know, we have little Zoom visits if I can't get there. And every rally I can go to, everything I can do to support those people I left behind, I am there because they are my family outside of my family. And I made it a point before I left. I said, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to help somebody out of here. And that's what I do today. Thank God. Thank you. Hello, good evening. How y'all doing? I just want to thank Roland. I want to thank Miss Sandra. She's been awesome. And uh, I just want to thank everybody that supported us, wrote letters, and in that result, we was freed and I'm sitting here with y'all today. It's truly a blessing. In 1993, on Christmas Eve, my sister, he went out of her house. So we left walking, no, we left driving, going to the car, uh, trying to look for the gas man. Because anybody know Mississippi, you have, you have gas tanks. And so the gas man can come out anytime he wants to and fill your gas tank up. And then you just pay him. Now that was back in Mississippi when, that's, that's just how it was in Mississippi. And, um, that night we had stopped at the store and two of the guys that I knew that I had worked with, my sister car one stop and my daddy told us he wasn't coming to get us. So we asked them for a ride. They took us down the dirt road. And one of them tried to make sexual advance with Jamie in the back seat. So we left walking. Christmas day we were sitting there getting ready because my dad's birthday was on the 24th so we always have them a party and mama always gonna cook and um we were sitting there and uh i had went to the back to the bathroom and i heard somebody say get out get out get out and i mean I'm, i looked out the window at the bathroom I said, what the police doing here jamie anybody know jamie me and her was like two peas in a bucket it was six kids we were the last two and we have always been close. 
So I'm back there in the bathroom. I'm really high because I want to know what's going on. So Jamie said, Gladys, they got a warrant for us for accessory to um, robbery. I said, what? So when I came out there, by that time, my daddy had came and him and the sheriff department, they didn't get along. They didn't like him because we was from the city and they felt like that, um, you know, with Mississippi type, they think from city people, they think they know everything. They just don't want them to uncover nothing, what's going on. If you're not going to play ball with them, they're going to send you somewhere. And so my daddy wouldn't play ball with them. He was a nightclub owner, his whole family them. They uh, ran nightclubs and they bootlegged. And the sheriff wanted my daddy to work for him. And my daddy said no. So they knew it's in the book, buy the book, read it. Everything I'm telling you is real. And um, so when we got down there at night, the sheriff um, told us, We'll let you go if you just tell us uh, what's your daddy connection. I told him, I said, I don't know, because my daddy was the type of man. He didn't let his family know what was going on. He, he never involved us in anything he did. And so we, uh, we sat there to after the holidays. We got a lawyer. We stayed out on date. We stayed out on trial. We stayed out for a year. But during that year, they was building up their evidence. They got three young men, which was 14, 16, and 17. They parents, they was running the streets and everything, and so they coerced them and made them sign a statement saying that me and Jamie um, told them to do the robbery and that um, they didn't have nothing to do with it. And so the, um, the sheriff and the DA and them, they all wrote letters the boys signed, and so when it was upgraded to armed robbery then, it went from accessory to armed robbery. In October the, uh, October the 3rd, we had a two-day trial. And um, the boys got on the stand. Chris got on the stand. He told them, he said, they didn't have nothing to do with it. He was 16 at the time. Um, Gregory was 14. They, Gregory told that they was, they signed, the, the state was already wrote out when they came to them. They just signed it because they wanted to go home. You have 14, 16, and 17 year old. They was from California. Their mother and father wasn't active in their life. So we was convicted of not one, but two. But let me bag up. The men that we had supposed to rob, one of them stayed on the stand that he didn't even have no money, but they still gave us life for him. The second one, they had a wallet. He said, I thank you, man. He said, he said uh, so the, the uh, prosecutor asked to say, well, how much money? He said, I thought it was 11 or $20. Come to find out all the money was still in the wallet. I'm going to get back. I'm going to get y'all to tell y'all about that. So we got life for him. So we ended up with double life sentence with no parole. I was four months pregnant. I was 19. Jamie was 21. Um, it was hard. We went to um, Rankin, Rankin County facility in uh, Pearl, Mississippi, where we done our 16 years. 32 days, 7 hours, and 30 minutes. <laughs> you, 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 it's just something you just don't never forget. And um, my father passed, and my mother had moved to Florida because she just couldn't take it no more. That little 4'8 four four woman, she fought. She fought. My, my father passed in um, 2003, and we had to go to his funeral in Shackles. And we was at the grave site, and he was going down. And I can remember me, my mom, and Jamie, and my sister, and we were standing there, and they was lowering my daddy down. And my mama said, I'm going to finish what you started. And when I turned out tears, and she said, I'm going to fight. My mother had an eighth grade education. My dad couldn't read and write. My mother brought a nation together. Jamie started, um, that's when they could sell typewriters in prison, so she bought a typewriter. It was $250. She got typing and she made a booklet, a booklet. And my mother, 
she started passing them out, she started mailing them out, and a lady named Nancy Lockhart, she worked there for uh, Operation Push, Jesse Jackson. My mom had been sending letters and letters and pamphlets to him, but that day, it got into the right hand. Nancy Lockhart, she was an advocate for freeing um, incarceration. She was big on incarceration. And her and my mother hooked up, and next thing I know, it just started spreading, and people started coming in, we started getting letters, and I had just got out of school that day, and I was in the dorm, I was sitting in my room, and I was laying back, and I was saying, Lord, it was December, it was December 28th, it was my daughter's birthday, um, Olivia. And I was saying, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm just tired, I'm tired. I said, I hold I said, we doing this, we doing that, won't everybody like Haley Barbara ain't gonna break, he ain't gonna break. So I said, you know what, Lord, I know that you give him life. You make him breathe. And December the twenty eighth, they came over the TV. Uh Haley Barbara had spent the Scott Sister sentences and they will be going free. Y'all talking about somebody, hold on, baby. I, I got up and I would dance. I would run it down that hall. I said, is it real? Is it real? I said, is it real? They, was in their room. they said, yeah. They said, your turn needs you. I said, damn, just get my stuff. I said, no. And uh, so after doing 16 years and 32 days, we was free. But we wasn't free. And that's what the world don't know. Me and my sister, my sister died on parole. We is on lifetime parole. And when Haley Barbie left office, he pardoned everybody except me and my sisters. He pardoned rapists, he pardoned murders. He did not pardon me and my sister. I go meet with a probation officer every month. And I do what, you know, I do what I have to do. But it's not right. Me and my sister did not commit this crime. They could, did not commit that crime. It was so much injustice in our case that it don't make sense. People don't believe when I say, didn't nobody get killed or hurt? I said, no, ma'am. What? How you get two life sentences? I said, I don't know. You need to tell me because I'm still wondering that because I'm still going to see a probation officer after almost 30 some years. This case is 1993. We caught this. This case was given to us in 1993. It's 2022 and we still serving two life sentences on parole. But despite, I mean, despite of all injustice and having my baby there, my mom came and got her. When we were released, Courtney was 15. She was two, she was four months in my belly when I went there. And it's 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 been a real struggle when you get out and you have done all that time with your kids and when they was younger, when they 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 younger and now when you get out, they like they got babies. And and it's like the world, and like she was saying, in our mind, we think the world stopped. Cause they were still using beepers. Now when I got out, they had Walmart, they had cell phone. I was like, what is going on? But um, despite of that, me and my sister, we wrote, we wrote our book because we wanted everybody to know the truth. And we wanted everybody to know who, who Jamie and Gladys was. And three years ago, we started our organization called Sisters of Hope where we do GED and GED classes and workforce uh, skills for women that's coming out, women that's never been in there, and whoever else want to get their GED. It's been a hard, it's been a long road. And when my sister passed away, I wanted to give up and commit suicide or go back to prison. Because I had lost so much. I was tired of losing. I lost my dad, I lost my sister, I lost my mama, I lost my grandma. When I got out, wasn't nobody here but my kids and grandkids. And I could hear my sister, you know, she used to tell me all the time, uh, we not gonna be in here, we going home. We going home because prison formed your mind to tell you that don't nobody love you or you not never going nowhere and this and that. And 
the first two years I was in there, I tried to commit suicide because I just couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't accept the fact that you gave me two life sentences and I ain't even kill nobody. I ain't even do nothing. But I didn't know back then that God was preparing me for the woman that I am today. I advocate. I, 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 we work with um, departments of juvenile justice. We work with other women's. Um, like I say, we, we have our organization. We're a nonprofit. And we do GED classes. And we do um, testing. And we also try to sponsor each lady or man that come through the door. And so we, I have, I brought some t-shirts and I bought some books. Every book y'all purchase and every t-shirt y'all buy is going back into the organization so we can keep sponsor ladies to get their GED and work skill. So they don't want to have to go through or stand on the corner to sell drugs or get on welfare. They can be able to make a living, decent, honest living and raise their kids. And so... It's, it, it's, it's been a long road, but we're going to keep on fighting. Now we're at the point now, um, we petitioned Mississippi and we petitioned Florida because we're under two set of rules. We're under Mississippi rules and we're under Florida rules. We have to ask, you know, when we go wherever we need to go, we have to get permission. We have to get travel pay. Uh, we have to pay a fee. And... But despite, and I tell people, I say, you know, I was hurt and I was angry. I said, but God prepared me for what I need to do. And that's helped my sisters and brothers not go where we went to. And 19, let me see, what's that, 19, eight, 18, that same prison that I done them 16 years and 32 days, me, my sister, and two more inmates and our pastor, we, want, we walked through that prison, though. We fed 250 inmates, and we gave 250 care packs. And I walked that ground, and I walked that ground, and I let them know I'm not giving up on y'all because I left a lot. And like Sister Paula said, if it weren't for them, I couldn't have made it. I have, I have seen girls hang themselves. I have seen them get beat. I have seen them get raped. It's not no joke. That's why I get up every morning and do what I do because I want to give back because it was so many that wrote letters, so many that marched, so many just just sent cards just to say, sister, you are you are right. We love you. Hold your head up. And and doing that, that what kept me going along. So that's why I do what I do and that's why I'm here because I love y'all and I really appreciate y'all having us here. Thank you for that, Gladys and yeah. Cynthia and Paulette. Um, anyway, so before I go on, uh, I just want to say that um, it's, it is really hard, the things that um, they, my sisters up here talked about, it's hard for people to really relate to being in prison and everything that you have to go through and even some of the smallest things that seem to be, seem small to everybody else, uh, it's not really that small. Like, who said, uh, you said, uh, when, they, when you got out, when you were, before you came to prison, mm -hmm. they had um, beepers. the beepers. Yeah. Well, when me and Paulette went to prison, they had rotaries. <laughs> Anybody young here may not even know what a rotary phone is. <laughs> And listen, when we went to when we went to jail, they had those galvanized buckets. They had tray, real trays that you see in prison with the ten cups, only a spoon to eat with. You know, yeah. So that's how it was. But anyway, there's we, all of us have stories that we can relate to. I can relate to everything that each one of these women have said and relate to in my life. And I'm sure everybody can feel something and relate to because we're pretty much all the same. We have just maybe different categories, but pretty much everybody's the same. And there's, there's always something that is lurking to try to suck you up, take you in, take you under, break you. And prison definitely is one of them. We lived in a time capsule. 
And so it was hard for us to catch up too, but thank goodness we had so much support from our families, from our and from my wonderful family that's sitting here, my husband, the love of my life, and my sisters, and my sister-in-law, and uh, my niece, Monet, and everybody, my son back there. And so, you know, um, I just thank everybody for the support they've given us. And uh, anyway, so my name is Debbie, and um, I am, was currently, I'm currently Debbie, but I was um, formerly Debbie Africa from the MOVE organization and also the MOVE 9, one of the MOVE 9 who were recently um, released from prison in 19, 2018 I was, and 2019, uh, 2020 Chuck, my brother, my brother was. Um, I usually tell this story more so when I talk about myself and the separation that my son and my daughter and I went through. And um, that story is still with me and I'm gonna tell a little bit about that, but I kinda wanna talk about my mother because I was her daughter, her child. Chuck was her son. And that I was so busy focused on what I lost and with my children that I really didn't have the energy, the mindset, really to even focus on what she was going through and what she could have been going through. She was 42 years old when I went to prison. I was 22. And um, for 38 years, she fought for my freedom until the day she died. She not only fought for my freedom, but my brothers and the rest of the Move 9 too, along with her side partner, Louise, and they were both known as Laverne, Laverne and Louise Africa. Um, Louise owned a house on 6221 Osage Avenue that was um, bombed in 1985 in Philadelphia. Um, but anyway, as I said, I was going to focus more on her because I couldn't imagine what she went through. Here it is, I was arrested in 1978. I had a two-year-old baby in my arms and I was eight months pregnant. Um, that two-year-old was raised by my mother along with the baby that I eventually had in my jail cell in September. And I couldn't even imagine, my mother had already raised her children, five children, pretty much by herself. And she faced a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations. She faced a lot of heartache. But she took my two children ba from babies and she raised them also. You know, and the heartache, the pain, the se of separation that I went through, not only being separated from my children, but my husband. He also did 40 years in prison along with me. So they had no parent. They had their grandmother and they had their aunts and uncles. And one, or, one of their uncles didn't turn out to be so great, but <laughs> they were quite a good, a good influence on him. So, but, <laughs> but I thank him because he did other things in their lives to protect them, knowing that their father would kill him if, the, if he even tried. <laughs> <laughs> to encourage them into any kind of wrongness, even though he was doing a lot of wrong himself. However, I love all my sisters, my brothers, my nieces, my nephews, uh, you know, I mean, my sister-in-law, everybody that has, you know, have been there to support me, whether it be taking, helping to take care of my children or, or just helping me, my brothers. Um, but my mother, getting back to her, she was very compassionate, she was very, um, but she was very strong and no nonsense. She had five ki kids to raise and she couldn't take no, she couldn't be, she had to be no nonsense. Um, but she was a warrior and she is my unsung hero. Um, my mother not only raised my children after raising her own and her baby was only 16, her child was only 16 years old, but she also helped with my sister's children and a whole lot of things along the way. She she walked those sidewalks with demonstration for demonstrations with picket signs. 
with on her shirt, free the move nine, her and my aunt Louise, along with my sisters and other people, Michael's brothers, talking to any politicians that they could talk to, mayors, congressmen, city officials, anything that came down in that prison that they were doing to any of us, they was on the case. They was writing letters, they was going to the prison, they were confronting people that they, that had a hand in any of them doing anything wrong to us or threatened us. Um, and she did this for 38 years. She never saw my homecoming. She passed away in 2010 and I was released eight years later. Um, Michael, my husband, Michael, who also did 40 years in prison, as I said, also lost um, a lot of his family, his parents, um, a couple of his, two of his sisters and brothers. And that just trickled down to generations. You know, incarceration don't just stop at the person that's being incarcerated. You know, it's like Cynthia said, it's a breakdown. It's a breakdown. It is a threat. And it, it definitely, definitely is a killer. So that thing don't just stop at the person that they're saying they're punishing for whatever crime or not that they're committing. It doesn't stop, it doesn't just stop at a person. It trickles down. My children were raised by people, their, their grandparents, not by their parents. Um, it affected my sisters, it affected my brothers, it affected my husband, it affected his sisters. Um, people lost their lives. Coming up on visits, it's just, it, it seems like, okay, well, at least they get visits every week, or at least they get, you may get visits every week, but you know how hard that is? Anybody that has children just know how hard it is to send your child to school at five years old. You know, you might cry, and the kid may be happy, but you're still going to cry because you feel like, you know, that's my baby. And, you know, you don't want to see that. You don't want to see them separated. So visits were really not a relief. They added to it because any time I would see my children when they were small, I, it was, I couldn't even take it. My, like my whole day was just ruined, you know. But it should have been a happy time. It should have been a happy moment, but it really... At the time, it felt good, but really it didn't. And when you see your child walk away and their babies and they cry and they don't, they may not remember it later, but at the time, you don't know that they're not gonna remember that. You only can feel what you can feel at that point. So prison is just designed to break you down and you just fall against the hearts of your mother, of your father, of your family who are there for you and you just have to pick up the pieces if you can. Um, that's why it's just so good to be in company with these women up here who have just fought so hard to stay alive because for sure, like you wanted to, thinking about committing suicide for sure, you either gonna survive or like you said, you bury yourself and just try to keep on going. You just try to make it. Um, so anyway, um, I did have my baby in a, um, a jail cell and I kept him for four days and, um, they didn't know it, but they never knew it. <laughs> so I had him and, uh, I kind of hit him and I, you know, wouldn't make no, uh, let him make noise and, you know, he was pretty good. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't do too much, <laughs> but so anyway, um, when I was going to, we were on, in court at the time, going to court at the time, and one of the um, one of the other move sisters, I thought it was Janet, was in my group. And when they went up, she went up there. The judge asked her, well, "Where's Debbie? How come she's not in court?" And she said, "Well, Debbie just had a baby in a jail cell." And he said, "What? Really?" And the officer, I think it was Kitchen, I think it was Kitchen, and maybe Bailey, because Paulette was there also, and my sister Gail was there. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but anyway, um, they asked, well, where was she at? 
And he said, well, who's going to get to the bottom of this? Where is she at? I want to know. And so I was, oh, no, she had, she, you know, I just saw her. I just checked in on her and she, uh, you know, she still had it. She was still had, had a stomach and uh, she didn't have any babies. So when they all came down the hall, you could hear this click, 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 click. Because we were, we, they isolated us. They locked us away, away from the population. So we were behind two double doors. And they locked us in there. But we were in separate cells. And they came clicking up and they came in there. Knock, knock, knock. Uh, oh, oh, she did have the baby. So I'm laying there with my son. It was all his curly hair. He was so cute. And everybody was fussing over to Merle singing a song so that they wouldn't hear. She was singing. I forgot the song she was singing, but anyway, maybe. I don't know what she was saying. Glory, glory, hallelujah, or something like that. <laughs> but it was a glorious day, but it was also very, very bitter because I knew I had to give him up. I had to. Michael says I didn't have to. I could have kept him. He said, Mom, you could have kept me. <laughs> I'm almost sorry I didn't try to keep him as long as I did, but my, I'm just a very practical thinker. Sometimes I think too practical and it just mushrooms into the wrong choices. But in my mind, I was thinking if I tried to keep him and they try to get him and try to wrestle him away from me, that was just something I really just couldn't bear. So my thinking was to be practical. Okay, let's just say we had him, but he can go home with my mother. So I had him for four days and eventually I just had to you know, give him to my mother, but without a fight. And um, I was turned around as uh, I was holding him. I was walking up the hall. And it's this, up the corridor of the prison or jail was 63 cells long. And the cells were pretty big. And my sisters walked me down the hall and turned me around to each cell, letting everybody know that this is a healthy baby. Nothing's wrong with him because we were always being threatened by the cops some kind of way with some type of violence. And so we did, she wanted that they wanted to make sure that they were all right. My son was all right. And I was all right too. So that's what they did. I, I walked, walked this long car after having this baby to go, cause I had to, he had to be released from the hospital. I couldn't just give him to my mother from the jail. So after I went to the hospital, um, with the protection of my sisters and especially my sister, she said, they would, they would actually, let me back up a little bit. They were going to take me out through a, um, the, the, the uh, ambulance on a stretcher. And my sister looked at them and she said, she looked at them and looked at them in the eye. She said, you ain't taking my sister nowhere. She said, no, get them out of here. She could see that she just did not trust them. She did not trust them. And it was L Lieutenant Wilhelmina's speech at the time. He was at the House of Correction. And she said, Okay, 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 well, okay, we're not gonna, nope, go away, go away, go away. So that's when they walked me down the hall and she had one of her own officers take me in a, a, a car. And he was a really nice officer, Officer Pryor. I'll never forget him, but he was very nice. And um, so finally, you know, my mother took him home and then, you know, later on, um, as time went on, Paul would ask me, always ask me, well, how's the baby, Debbie? And I said, oh. Oh, the baby's fine, Paula. Yeah, we just had a visit, and uh, I just saw him. You know, he's he's doing really good. You know, time goes on, and she says, "How's the baby, Debbie?" And I said, "Oh, he's good, Paula. He's two years old. You know, he's okay. He's doing really. You know, I said, here's some pictures. We might have a picnic a picnic visit. And how's the baby, Debbie? So this happened year after year, <laughs> month after month, and finally, she said, "Debbie, how's the baby?" I said, "Paula, baby's 35 years old." <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, and it is awesome. It's awesome, but anyway, I I, I might have forgot something, but I don't even know how much time I have. But um, anyway, but just getting back to my mother, I just want to just you know just hail her up as my unsung hero, and my aunt Louise, who also was my hero. Like I said, they pounded the sidewalks and they beat the drums and they they talked through every politician that they could. They did everything under the sun that they could do to try to get our release, except pull out weapons and i mean that to the fullest like they just and i my mother died of a broken heart is what i believe in but i have so many unsung heroes men as well as women um my husband is definitely my my number one hero and 
<laughs> and uh, my sister Gail and my niece Monet and my son Michael and Sandy. <laughs> so awesome. And all of you guys up here, like if we have so much support and so much camaraderie here. Yeah. We've only met each other. For, we've only been engaged with each other for a couple of hours and just already you can feel the, just the bond there. And that's how it is in prison. Like you, you do become a family. You become a family. And that family is just so, so strong and so um, protective of each other. And that's why, you know, you guys, what you're doing now and what you want to do is just so worth it. Right now, we do want to support each other and we're the same way. Whenever we t speak about anything, we're talking about our sisters back in Muncie, back in Cambridge Spring. Um, we're talking about people who really can really need to come home. Michi, Peachy, Rudy, like all them people have been there for 50 years, you know, that they didn't even have a mindset of what was going on, you know, of they had the mind of a teenager, whatever the case may be. But anyway, um, so it was a glorious home homecoming actually too. Like I was a bit, my whole family was just there. All my nieces, nephews, my Shane, Diane, David, Ruby, all of them. Robin is one of my really great heroes too. She took me shopping. She, I mean, it was, it's just, I can't even go on again. But anyway, I'm going to stop now and it's just read. Uh, I knew if I didn't have, you know, if I didn't write something to read a little bit to kind of like get some of my points across, I would be all over the place. So anyway, um, although the police did what they did and although, um, you know, we were um, in that situation because, well, it was it was unjust. It was just unjust. I didn't kill nobody. Chuck didn't kill nobody. Mike didn't kill nobody. But we were in prison for 30 to 100 years, and they just denied us year after year after year. We spent 40 years in prison, and then we finally got released after, like I said, so much support from beating the sidewalk, including Pam and all her support and everybody. So, so I just wrote a little something because I also do not want to um, exempt my own self from anything. So I just kind of put together a few pieces uh, a couple days ago and it's called Choices. Um, so 44 years ago, I made a choice. That choice ended in my serving 40 years in prison for something I did not do. My family was broken up. I was eight months pregnant when I was arrested and gave birth to my baby in my jail cell, while my two-year-old daughter at the time was left behind for my mother to raise also. I was not there to give them hugs when they left behind. I was not there to give them hugs when they needed it. I was not there when they cried for their mother and I was not there for their vulnerable years of need. I was there in a prison cell crying myself. I cried and I cried and I blamed. I was angry and bitter and hurt for all the people I let down, but mainly my children. I was in a jail cell riddled with guilt and wondering how I got here. How did this happen? Wondering how I allowed myself to be here to be there. I w it was a choice that I made to be in a place where I should not have been. When I was finally released after almost 40 years, for the first time ever, I attended my daughter's cookout at her age of 42 years old. I went to my son's birthday party, my first ever to attend his party, and he was turning 40 years old. Moving on with my life has been challenging but very fruitful and rich in lessons that I've learned and pass on to others. I survived and I am grateful. I also want to give my one of my last shout outs for my heroes and that's my daughter Wit, who is not here, but she is one of the strongest women that I know also. So choose your path, it's your choice especially for students, there's not that many here, but remember the choices you make affect 
other people. Wow, amazing, right? Let's give another a hand for all these wonderful women. Wonderful women who now you see why they're my sheroes. I know a lot of familiar faces in here have been pounding the pavement. Many have been mentioned. Pam Africa, of course, has been working tirelessly for decades. Pastor Collins, uh, yes, Dr. Collins, absolutely. I forgot. Here's the baby that I had in the prison cell. <laughs> hey, baby. How you doing? <laughs> I met that baby when he was 14 years old, and he's also been fighting for his parents his whole life. And I'm so happy to have him, Mike, Gail, all the family here. Dana is representing Cabby and other Cabby members. Thank you for being here today. There's some soldiers in this room who have been working for decades for these women. Uh, you know, I was signing petitions. I didn't do as much as I would have liked to, but I was signing petitions for the Scots, which was back before we ever met. So to have her here means so much. And to get to know these wonderful women over Jim steaks, some cheese steaks, pretty good, right? Oh, uh, she said, I gotta get me a cheese steak. And then they had some massages today, got a little pampering. So, you know, we had some good times it, it, and I'm gonna be sad to see you go back home to Mississippi. We might have to keep you making you miss your flight. Oh, uh, Florida, all oh, right. That's right, no, let's, not, let's not send you back to Mississippi. So, many of you were just introduced to these women and these stories today. Others already knew them. Um, if they weren't already your sheroes, I imagine you're thinking that they already are becoming your sheroes. Let me ask you something. I want to recognize Yusef Jones and everything. He doesn't think I recognize him behind that mask. Uh, Yusef tried to sneak in here, tried to sneak up, but I appreciate you coming out as well, Yusef, um, who's also been doing so much work for so, so long. So thank you for what you do. Um, let me ask you this. For those of you who are just meeting these women tonight and just hearing their stories tonight, had you known them back when they were incarcerated, would you have done something to help them get out? Okay, guess what? Just as they said, there are many, many others left behind. We don't have to free them anymore. We can support them and their struggles because reentry is difficult. But there are many others that they're working tirelessly for their family to bring home and we can join them in that work. And there's one woman in particular, I said I had a special treat I wanted to share with you. Maybe treat isn't the right word because it's a very tragic story um, before we move to the Q&A. So please, I want to have dialogue. I want to have your questions and they um, were more than happy to answer them. But if you could just Bear with me for five minutes, okay, before we move to that. How many people, raise your hand if you've heard of the name Melissa Lucio. Okay, good, good. Melissa Lucio is an innocent woman on Texas death row right now. She's been there about 11 years. You may notice on your seat some flyers, okay, um, and there's some information about her. I need you to help me. Because on April 27th, if the state of Texas has its way, they will execute an innocent woman. Now, I'm an abolitionist against the death penalty for the guilty and innocent. I'll make no apologies for that. We shouldn't be killing anyone. So at the same time, this woman is innocent. She was accused of killing her two-year-old child. She did not. If you don't know her story, or even if you know a little bit, I want to encourage you uh, to go to Hulu, Hulu. If you don't have Hulu, find somebody who does or come to me, I'll give you my password. You can check it out. We wanted to have one of Melissa's family members, her sister Sonia here tonight, if only through uh, virtual pre um, presentation. The family is so distraught that in just over a month that their sister, their daughter, their mother, because she had 14 children, she never abused any of them. They never interviewed any of the children, two of whom at least said in this documentary that they saw the baby fall down the flight of, the flight, um, of stairs. It was a fire escape. 
and very tall and fell, fell, and the baby died. And they, the mother had nothing to do with it. They browbeat her for hours and hours and hours into a false confession. And if you know anything about false confessions, they happen all the time. You've heard about the Central Park Five as an example, but that's just one of many. Um, so I'd like to, please humor me, share the trailer to this documentary. The name of it is called The State of Texas versus Melissa. Um, yes, maybe. Oh, could you, lovely person, turn the lights off for me, please? That's wonderful. Uh, maybe hit, hey, baby, <laughs> next to you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm milking that one. <laughs> all right, so let's watch the trailer. It is not going to tell you all of the ins and outs of the case, but it's going to hopefully pique your interest enough to make you want to go see this. And please, um, Facebook friend me if you're not already. Many of you are already my Facebook friend. Um, it's my profile picture. Help me spread the word. Watch the film, watch the film, watch the film. We're signing petitions. We want to save this woman's life. My name is Melissa Elizabeth Lucio. I'm 48 years old. I have 14 children. I've been on that road 11 years. There were bruises from head to toe. There were bruises on the face and the hair on the chest. This was the worst case of child abuse I had ever seen. Oh my gosh. She fell all the way down. From the first step up there, all the way down there. Imagine the baby fell. The baby? And did you see her fall or did somebody tell you that that's what had happened? That interview was never presented to the court. None of those kids ever said that their mom was being number one. It was during election times, my mother Villalobos was running again for DA. I'm the first Hispanic woman on death row, so this was a huge case for him. Bribery was endemic. He'd be compensated for favorable treatment in criminal cases. That was a plan put her away, my mother, poor, perfect target to help him win his election. She's no criminal, they're the criminals. They're the criminals. I hope if you haven't seen this documentary already that you will make it a point to see and to spread the word. Um, you can already see all of the politics behind the case, all of the lies, the corruption that lie behind this case, and it's going to be a serious tragedy if this woman is, is executed. She needs to come home to be with her family. The family is so distraught. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. And if you would like, thank you for sharing that. And if you would like to um, subscribe to email listserv from Death Penalty Focus, my um, comrade in the anti-death penalty movement that I've been involved in for decades now, the, um, A. Bonowitz sends updates on a regular basis. That's Death Penalty Focus. And there are um, Zoom meetings every weekend where the family does participate and, and share with all of the supporters what's going on. I think it's Saturdays. So um, thank you for signing the petition. Please help spread the word. The more people who uh, watch this film, the more objection we're going to have um, to this terrible wrong. Um, many of you know, as I do, exonerees from death row um, who've spent decades behind bars. Um, my dear friend from Delaware, Marlo, Jermaine Wright, has been here to speak at Rowan before. He did 25 years innocent. He's just one of 
oh, what's the count now? It's approaching 200. It's over 183 who've been exonerated. And there are more innocent people um, than just these women on death row, serving life, et cetera. So thank you for letting, allowing me to share this trailer. The point in this is these stories are in and of themselves compelling and should move us and inspire us and want to take action. But a lot of times we need direction with that action. So we need to end all of our presentations like this with a call to action. And right now, I specifically, because time is of the essence, like I said, April 27th, the call to action I'd like to leave you all with is to help me save Melissa. Okay, so let's do what we can. You, there are an um, address, it's not, it's just a quick Google if you wanna send her a card, send her love. The family is having a really difficult time. That's the only reason they weren't able to be with us today. They're struggling and they can't really get themselves together in order to be present today. So without further ado, thank you for that. I'd like to turn um, this next uh, period. We have um, time left. We were supposed to go to 8.30, we were running late, so we have at least half an hour for a Q&A period. So let's have some conversation. Anybody who would like to share statements of support to these beautiful women here, my dear friends, or have questions for them, please let me know. I'll come and share the mic, Dana. And, and if you could please use the mic because it will help Sunny with the recording. Hi, I would like to thank all you women. I'd like to thank y'all for your time, your talent, your courage, your bravery, um, and just for y'all being so transparent and being vulnerable because it takes a lot to sit up there and tell your story. I want to ask you, um, how much is your book? That's my question. It's funny. Okay, and you have some here with you? Like, Okay, I want to ask you, Deb, how can we support you? <laughs> yes. All right, we did. Okay, V. Cynthia, how can we support you? Oh, absolutely. P. Did Paulette, how can we support you? That's <laughs> not P. Diddy. That's what I'm talking about. I love all y'all. And I'm so proud of y'all. Keep striving and thriving, y'all. Thank you, Dana. And I'm proud of you, too, and all the work that you do. You're a survivor. These women, as I told them earlier, are, thank you, death penalty action. Thank ah, yes, of course. I, then I'll come back up to you, Cindy. Yes, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, I'm Cinnamon. And hi, Dana. <laughs> Uh, so I know Dana through the West Philly uh, Participatory Hub, um, and thank you, ladies. This is awesome. I'm also a survivor, um, and I just started speaking, doing speaking engagements, uh, and I'm actually still going through the pill press process. Uh, my uh, side is coming from a domestic violence. Uh, point of view, whereas though, you know, survivor of domestic violence, somebody hits you, what you gonna do? You gonna hit them back. <laughs> so you got three choices, fight, flight, or freeze, right? So somebody hit me, I hit them back. Um, and unfortunately, I was wrongfully arrested, wrongfully convicted. Um, I always say, well, I was only in jail for a month. But it's like, as you ladies know, a day is a lot. Two days, three days, four days. So, um, but definitely you ladies are, wow. I was holding back all my tears. I said, get back in there. I got on this eyeliner. Uh, <laughs> so, but all four of you ladies have very compelling uh, stories. I guess my question is, um, I have a blog on Instagram which focuses on uh, domestic violence because I've now become a domestic violence expert so I can go out in the community and hopefully come do some speaking engagements where I am. And uh, <laughs> so I just spoke to Villanova uh, last week. I did a lecture. Um, so it's the correlation between domestic violence, uh, the court system, and the abusers, because all abusers don't 
they still don't want to be abusers. Maybe they might want to change. So I want to get out there more. I guess my question is, how have you ladies been getting out there more to speak to the public? So first, because I was wrongfully convicted in Philadelphia, I was on the front page of the newspaper and um, people started to hear about my story. And um, But like I said earlier, I use social media as basically just uh, never shutting up, right? And I feel like a platform you know, could just be a place where you stand, but my voice is a platform. So I don't need the microphone, I don't need a stage, right? Uh, as long as I have voice and air in my lungs, I'm just gonna talk about it. Whether it's in front of my ring light, whether it's with you know ordinary people. So I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I feel like the platform is your voice, you know, and the breath that you add. And with that being said, I mean, it, the more people that hear you, the more people that will just call upon you to talk. But more importantly, it's your voice that you know is the platform. So. Well, mine's is the empathy that I have for those I left behind. When I share my stories, people hear it. Uh, I did like quite a few speaking engagements and other people heard what I said. So from there, it just keeps on going. You know, it's like a domino effect. And so that's what I do to get it out there, get it heard and keep it moving. Um, what did you say your name was? Cinnamon. Oh, cinnamon. Okay, like the spice. Okay. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it, and both um, Cynthia and um, Paulette described the things that I do too, me and my husband mostly. Um, we also, what we do, my, my husband and I, since we've been out since 2018, is we've done speaking um, events too, and one of them was Villanova too. So I think you got a good start. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> you definitely got a good start, and you know, young young minds really need to hear these stories. They need to hear, they need to hear advice. They need to hear, you know, don't, you know, don't miss, don't judge people so quickly. If you have a parent in prison, if you have a child in prison, you know, don't just ignore circumstances, listen to them. You know, everything is not black and white. You know, there are the gray areas, there are things in between that make a difference that makes your story, okay, well, you know, you see it on the news all the time. You hear, oh, yeah, okay, this person shot, you know, somebody because of whatever, and they go to jail. You know what, though? Yeah, they may be guilty of it, but you know what? You don't even know the inside story. You don't know whether this other person that harassed them, came to their house, came to the kid's school, trying to snatch them, trying to kidnap them, trying to do whatever, before you judge them and say, oh, he killed somebody. He is so wrong. He is so bad. Well. It's the same thing with parents and children and, you know, just try to listen and try to be open your heart to understanding. And you got a good start right there. So we also um, do um, filmmaking. And so we tell our story. We actually did um, make a 16-minute documentary about our lives. I mean, it's hard to put... 40, 50 years and 50, 16 minutes, but but filmmaking is also a good way to get your story out to make it, you know, and it doesn't even have to be real. You know, we got these phones now and you, you know, you could just make whatever, like Cynthia said, you do and just put it out there. You say, Miss, um, what's your name? Cinnamon. Miss <laughs> Cinnamon, I think you're doing a, a great thing. Um, connecting with uh, organization that's um, doing the domestic violence. Um, go out and speak to the women. That and networking, internet, social media. Like, like they said, make a video. But to really get out there, you have to network with other organizations. And once you start upgrade, I mean, networking with other organizations, it's going to start falling and start talking to the victims, start talking to the victims, get them involved and stuff like that. But networking and media, that's what's gonna get you where you need to go. Cindy Wu, good to have you here. 
Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm from uh, Food Not Bomb Solidarity. And so the question I'm going to ask you after hearing this amazing panel is about food and about food in prison and what's it like and how much do you get and can you get as much as you need and do they have gardens where you can, where, you know, where you can work. I know some people are, are locked up in places that have a garden and that's why I'm asking that. Um, and I just wanted to ask about, I mean, I'm looking at a lot of the menus now that my friends are sending me from our state institutions in Pennsylvania. And I'm saying like, soy this, soy that. There's no, there's no real, real, you know, food. It's soy, everything is soy and carbs. Soy and cake and bread and noodles and pasta and soy. And um, I just want to ask, so especially to like our long timers, was it always like that? Or ha have you seen it pro progressively getting worse? Um, and so I, I wanted to know about the food stuff. Um, and once, and I also want to thank you so much for speaking, uh, you know, and, and like, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big thing when you, you, it's like tearing a little piece of yourself out and giving it to people, you know, and everybody's looking at you and you're telling your, your innermost thoughts. So I really appreciate that, that you did that. Um, and one way that I, I'm thinking that I could support you is if I talk to anybody that has an organization or is looking for speakers. Can, would, would it be okay to, to give you, do I have your permission to give your, you know, to give your name and to, and to let them, you know, contact you? Thanks. Well, if Gladys has her way, we're all going on tour. She said, we need to take this on the road because this is a dynamic um, group right here. All right, who wants to address Cindy? Well, when I went to, uh, it was called House of Correction when I first got locked up. And uh, the food down there was not all that great. I mean, you had to eat something, you know, but it wasn't all that great. And then when I went to, and but you know, commissary, a lot of us lived off of commissary. And then if you had a guard, and that's, that's real, you might have a guard or two that like you enough to bring your sandwich or something, you know, that has happened uh, in some occasions. Uh, when I went to Muncie, the food wasn't terribly bad, but it was better than it was as the time went by, it got horrible. Horrible, okay? And so we had to, to eat to survive. And then, you know, the mood at that time, they start uh, getting vegetables and stuff like that where we could get vegetables and order vegetables, but they stopped all that, which was great. I was so glad they was able to do that so we could all could have some fresh vegetables. But uh, after that, the food just went down the drain. I mean, even terrible, terrible, terrible. It, it wasn't even enough to, I wouldn't even feed my dog some of that food that they were serving. You know, the best thing that they had in there was, uh, we made was cheat cheese. <laughs> you know, you make cheat cheese. <laughs> and then you made the bagels with the sashes and the cheese, and you might get some vegetables to throw up on it, like some onion and green pepper. You know, but that was the best way you could survive in there, but for real, the food was horrible. And you blow up on all that bread and stuff. So, like Paulette said, the county jail food sucks. It's literally like dogsy better than what they fed us. Um, when I went upstate, I predominantly ate commissary. I was fortunate enough to have money to be able to afford commissary. However, the food is predominantly made of uh, sodium, so you're always hungry, even if you eat a whole bunch of it. Um, I didn't really eat a lot of the chow hall food because um, I used to work in the kitchen, and to me, it wasn't that clean. Um, I worked in staff dining room for a little bit, so I would steal a lot of the vegetables that belonged to the guards and I would bring them back. Um, did a lot of desperate things to have vegetables, things that are humiliating, you know, putting vegetables in objects where, you know, we use the bathroom at. So it's really degrading, you know, what you have to go through in order to eat healthy. But um, we made it out 
and we're I'm extremely grateful. However, there's many women still suffering in there, and um, that's why we're here so that we could bring a voice to them. You know, so yeah. I, I echo what Paulette said, <clears throat> especially since well, we, you know, we went to the county at the same around the same time in House of Correction. The first meal that we had was cold waffles and homemade syrup. That was the only thing we had for breakfast. That was it. So when we got the munchy, like the food was delicious <laughs> because we ate like that for breakfast. Um, but my first meal at Muncie was, was um, I'll never forget it. They had brownies and ice cream and I'm really greedy, so I love food. So <laughs> I, have, I have brownies and ice cream they had and they had these two, two pork chops you got at the time and they were stuffed and the food was homemade and it was homemade stuffing by Burt Brown. I'll never forget it. It was cornbread stuffing, Burt Brown. And I'm telling you, because coming from the county after three years and going up to Muncie and eating that, it was it was really, really good. But as Paula said, it just digressed. You know, it just got worse and worse and worse. However, um, I would definitely advocate for gardens for, for um, any of the prisons because most of the prisons, state prisons are built on some kind of uh, they have land yeah. and for the last before I left for the last seven years we had a garden there and that's what helped us tremendously um, so I mean I was the harvest chair of our garden committee for seven years and we harvest we we planted every fall we, I mean it was and the food was good we got to you know pass it out once we if you live in a certain unit that is but I would advocate for gardens for people for for the population and it's cheaper. It saves government money. Yeah. It saves government money. You eat healthy and you know, and you can pick and choose. Well, <laughs> in a, um, our county food, the hospital cooked our food, so it was like oh, it was like okay, it went all that. But once I got to Rankin County uh, Correction Facility in Pearl, Mississippi, um, I don't. It's a Men's prison called Parsham, and it's rows and rows and acres and acres and acres. So they raise our fruits and our vegetables. And what they do is they send it to us. But that, that food was horrible. I can agree with the ladies. I ate, I ate at the canteen, and I had to smuggle food into the units. You got to do what you got to do. And uh, that's the only way I survived. And we used to do chili pies and uh, noodle wraps. And I mostly ate at the uh, canteen because last time I had went to the hall, and they usually give us a lot of greens, uh, a lot of um, uh, beans and stuff like that. Roaches all up in the greens and the thing. And I just didn't go back. But um, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible in Mississippi, too. It's horrible. It's horrible. I have to say, I'm feeling a little guilty taking you for cheesesteaks now. I feel like we should have gone to Salad Works or something instead, but you deserve whatever you want. You want a cheesesteak? I got it for you. That's right. That's right. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Hi. I just want to say thank you guys for sharing. You're all beautiful black um, women of color. And <laughs> try and try. Um, and I really do admire you guys, you know, continuing to go on because I I have a black mom and she's gone through. She hasn't gone gotten long sentences, but she has gone in, in and out of the justice system. And we went. We lived in a predominantly white area, so it was you know she fit the description or oh we think you were abusing a dog or something. It was just anything. So I just wanted to ask. Um, what did you teach your children and what did your family teach your children about the justice system, either while you guys were in or when you guys came out? So um, my baby was really young when I first went to prison, so I never wanted to mention the word prison to her. Um, so I told her I was in a hospital. And I kept up the little shenanigans about a hospital for years. It wasn't up until she started asking me, like, well, you don't look sick. And I would be like, well, mommy's sick up here. <laughs> you know, I was trying to, to dodge the question because I had life without parole, right? So it wasn't like one of those things where I was like, oh, mommy's going to be home in six months. 
or mommy's going to be home in five years. You know, like I really didn't know when I was coming home because in Pennsylvania, nobody ever gets out. That's the, we're all here right now. It, it's well for Pennsylvania people. Paulette was a juvenile lifer. I want a federal habeas petition, but it doesn't happen enough. You know, so being up here is, is where miracles. So I didn't really know what to tell my daughter. It wasn't up until she got a little bit older that I started to mention the word lawyer. You know, mommy's lawyer or mommy's becoming a lawyer, you know, things like that so that her little mind could bend and to understand like, wow, lawyer, well, you know, so the hospital situation is gone, you know, but I never wanted to mention jail or life. So we never really had those talks. It wasn't until she started to understand and she realized it was barbed wires and, you know, that I was being held against my will. But um, I would just try to educate her on the Constitution and teach her her rights. And she would be like, well, I don't want to learn about that. And I said, like, well, Bianca, it's important that you learn about those things, you know, because so so my family really wasn't educated about the law. You know, they're immigrants. Um, they weren't really interested in it. So we didn't have a lot of common in those areas. It would be me just talking about my injustice on visits and just trying to vent everything out and try to teach them as much as I could while we had visits. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but hopefully it's okay. Well, mine was, uh, my son was wise to be such a young kid. And when he was like about eight or nine, he hated the cops. And the reason why he hated the cops, because he knew that's who locked his mother up. So he would throw bricks and stones, well, stones and, and, and uh, rocks at the cop cars and all that. And <clears throat> my father had to talk to him and tell him that's not the right way to go because that's not going to get your mother home. But Jonathan didn't care because he felt like Yo, they locked my mother up. I don't like them, and I'm throwing rocks at the car. So you know, so he he, he later on he he realized that as he got older, that wasn't the right thing to do. He was a kid. He was being rebellious because I was locked up, and. Uh, he figured at some point I would get out, but then as I didn't, time went on and on, uh, he, he said, he asked me one day and it just blew my mind. I think he was like maybe 13 years old then. And he said, mom, he says, um, are you on death row? I said, no, I'm not on death row. What do you mean? He said, well, if you don't come home, that means you on death row, you probably would die in jail. And that just blew my mind. And I don't know where he got that notion, but you know, I guess kids, you know, after a while, look, my mom ain't coming home, she don't come home, she gonna die to you. And it really started making me think. I said, you know what? After a while, I, we was in the visiting room, I said, y'all know what? My family came up, I said, you know what? Jonathan had a point there when he said, Mom, if you don't, are you on death row? And I was like, seriously speaking, I am. Because if I don't get out, I'm dying here. So, you know, that's how things went with him as far as the law and his understanding. And then we had to explain that to him. And um, he got it, but he didn't get it. That's all I can say, because he wanted his mother home. Short, sweet. My family taught my children, there ain't no justice in this system. Right. Your parents didn't kill nobody. They in jail unjustly. They took them away. The system is rotten. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can agree with you on that. Cause that was my mom. Um, my mom and dad, they um, they taught my kids that um, that's injustice, whether you white, purple, black, or whatever. Um, in the state of Mississippi, it don't matter because it's, it's a good old boy, rather, you know, and they, my mother fought so hard, so they knew where we were because they was out um, advocating with us. My daughter, I seen one, um, I seen one clip and I was, sometimes I go back and I just, and look at all the clips on YouTube and, and everything, everybody, and so, um, they was in uh, Jackson on, at the Capitol, 
And my oldest daughter at the time, uh, my oldest daughter at the time, she was, I think she's Olivia about 12 or 11. And she, I mean, she gave a, a speech I never thought she had in her. But they, they was, they would, they knew what happened because my mother and father didn't let it, didn't let it go. It was around the house talk. My mom stayed on the computer night and day, trying to get us out, coming to visitations. You know, it always was a talk about me and Jamie around the house and the injustice. So they knew growing up what was going on. Thank you. I'd like to thank this Rowan student for not only asking this great question, but for being here. And I would like to point out that she also works for The Wit, which is our school paper. So I appreciate you coming. Yeah. So we're just meeting tonight, but you and I need to stay in touch because what you may not be aware of, because it, COVID kind of got in the way, is a couple years before COVID, I started a, a organization, a student organization on campus called Youth Empowerment Program. And it's for college students who have had or currently have at least one incarcerated parent. And we have a really tight-knit group, about 20 of us, many of whom are alum at this point who graduated during COVID. Um, and you're a success story to be here. And I appreciate you being here, um, not only because of the passion of what's happened in your family, but for the love of these woman and women here and for telling the story. I appreciate that. And when the WIT article comes out, I'll be happy to share it with with you all, um, and I'm sure it's gonna be great. So thank you for being here. Um, we'll connect afterwards, so. Um, I know our time is running short. We can ask, oh yes, we had another question from Pastor Collins, and, and if we have another quick one after that, we can entertain that as well, or we can just move to more informal conversation. People can come up and get pictures and have conversation, but I definitely would like to have, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, Pastor Collins um, participate. For me, real quick. Um, Gladys, I saw you and your sister years ago in Philadelphia. You had a golf club doing a fundraiser for Ardella's house. And that, that touched my soul. I want to say to all of you that all you beautiful, powerful, strong ladies, um, I would, I've been touched uh, recently to incorporate the story of the, the arrest, death, of crucifixion of Christ to see him as a political prisoner, which he was. So in recent years, I've had people like Sister Pam come and speak on Good Friday, et, et cetera. I think that the faith community does not play a large enough role in the abolition movement. And uh, that's, that, that's my assignment, is to incorporate and to be an advocate. So what I'm saying that to say to all of you is I'd like to invite you, if you're going to be in the area on Good Friday, to give a word uh, at our church from your perspective uh, on this whole thing of political oppression. Because without this, without the oppressive system, you would not have experienced what you've experienced. And, uh, and, and hopefully we can get the video and things out to the faith community to get them more involved in this whole process. So that's all I'm gonna say, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Collins, for basically continuing to do the work. The vow that you're making is continue to do it because I've seen you many, many times out pounding the pavement and doing great, great work. Before we wrap up, I know you all have spoken at Villanova, right? Cornell, some of you. What other universities have you been to? Good observation there. And with that, Cynthia, I would like for you all to reach under your seat or on the table and open your bags. We got a little gift for everybody. Because I want you to remember. <laughs> I know, right? So Debbie is a returning speaker. She, still, she got her first one. I just want to say, did you get that from Cornell or from Villanova? Just saying. Just saying, this might be your favorite university that you've ever spoken at, right? Because I don't think any of these other universities gave you swag like this. So you can put it away, but before you leave, we're going to have a picture with you all wearing it. To, um, you will throw it on. You don't have to wear it at this particular moment. And yeah, Debbie and Mike, and Mike got theirs last time they were here. So, right, right? So, um, yeah, we just wanted to give you a little reminder of your favorite new, if, if it wasn't already, your favorite new university that you've ever spoken at. 
Yeah, you're very, very welcome. So, um, wow, this has been amazing. I'm sorry? Oh, that clock is wrong. Yes, it is not 7.37. We do not have another whole hour to go. <laughs> you know what, I've been watching this right here. 8.37. So um, we're seven minutes over somehow, even though we got started late. We still managed to sit in kind of on time. I know people came a long way, so even though I'm sure we can continue to have more questions and comments, we will wrap up at this time, but I already know from conversation with these women that they're willing to hang around and have conversation and pictures, um, hugs, lots of you know exchanges between all the, I can't thank you all enough for being out here. Thank you so, so much. This does my heart good. You know, it's a lot of work putting this together. Mary Beth knows, she's been my um, right hand uh, student and um, she did this beautiful flyer for us. She's helped to promote and, and do a lot of good work. <laughs> So, um, and every time I'm like, ugh, that's a lot of work. I don't know if I'm going to do that again. But I do it again because, and every time I'm like, at the end, I'm like, yes, this is what is worth it. This was worth it. The people who needed to be here were here. Thank you for coming all the way. Um, and let's give them one more big round of applause. And remember, use the messages you heard tonight to inspire you to continue to do the work that I know many of you are already doing. And let's save Melissa. All right, let's save Melissa Lucio. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. I appreciate you all.